when I look at the economics of our business today, I see a very robust business. I'm very happy to say that. But I see huge opportunity for us to grow the brand and grow the engagement with our consumers, particularly given that we are operating in a period where consumers need more support than ever before because of the two years that we've all just been through. Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Veneri. Today, I'm joined by SoulCycle CEO, Evelyn Webster. In this episode, we talk about the pandemic's impact on brick and mortar fitness, how SoulCycle navigated the roller coaster of reopenings and restrictions. Plus, we discuss the company's omni-channel offering, including its smart bike, digital content, and outdoor classes. Let's get into it. Hi, Evelyn. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Joe. It's lovely to be here. Looking forward to the conversation very much. Excited to chat. And, you know, we're talking offline a little bit before we started. And typically I, I welcome folks to the show and ask them to, to introduce the brand and, and talk about the company. I think with SoulCycle, that's probably not necessary. Most people in the fitness industry and kind of beyond are familiar with the brand, but maybe tell us about yourself and the give us the current kind of status of what's going on at SoulCycle. Great. Thank you. Of course. Uh, well, I'm very happy that you said that, that, that SoulCycle needs no introduction. I also agree with that. Um, so I'm Evelyn. I am relatively new to SoulCycle. I joined Soul. In fact, I joined the industry about a year ago. And uh, I joined after having 30 plus years in media. Yeah, there have been as many or more similarities between media and, and fitness than perhaps I, even I ha had expected. Um, I had long been a consumer of Soul Cycle. So, you know, I was running international publishing and media companies uh, for a very long time, but I was an active Soul Cycler. And so it's a very odd thing when you're sitting on a bike as a you know executive thinking, oh my goodness, if I were at Soul, this is what I do with it. Um, and so when I saw that there was an opening, I was thrilled to join. Um, of course, when I joined a little over a year ago, I thought I was joining to bring Soul out of this kind of 12 month period it had been through, which was the pandemic, which of course we're all living through at the same time. Um, and I think I was a little bit, uh, I was optimistic that, that we might see an end to the pandemic a little bit earlier than we did. So the last 12 months have been, I mean, truly phenomenal. This is a, it's a wonderful industry to work in. It's a quite a close knit industry. So I've made lots of new friends. Everybody's been very welcoming. It's obviously been quite challenging managing a business that is predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly a brick and mortar business. You know, we have 85 studios across the country in Canada, in, in London. And, uh, you know, for much of the pandemic, Many of those studios were closed. Um, we then decided that we were going to pivot and take this experience that had been built upon clipping in in a darkened, candlelit room with the music pumping to an outdoor uh, interpretation of the band. You know, at the height of the pandemic, we had 30 outdoor activations in broad daylight with six feet of distancing, you know, he huge headphones on our heads. And that's how we were riding. And so... It's just been a phenomenal ride, if you like, excuse the pun, at Seoul, because we've had to pivot and turn and twist and turn and adapt and evolve at every step of the pandemic. And what I'm thrilled about now, sitting here literally 12 months after joining, is it does feel now that we have some serious momentum with riders coming back. I mean, I've often said that our uh, our community is our superpower and our community really, 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 really wanted to get back to in-person and in real life. And so uh, we're seeing some tremendous momentum now. We all obviously in the midst of a pandemic also launched our own at-home fitness solution with our partners over at Equinox Media and Equinox Plus. Uh, so we've been busy. I mean, you know, it, um, obviously a challenging time, lots and lots of change, but, but also I always feel that... Uh, sometimes the most challenging and disruptive of industries are the impetus for the greatest innovation. And I think that's what we've seen in this industry over the last couple of years. And I've certainly experienced over the last year at, at Seoul. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, almost an entire uh, career's worth of pivots and changes and adaption really in, in two years. And as you mentioned, coming, you know, from not a fitness background, but kind of a con fitness consumer background, obviously that kind of tie in with the media and the content uh, certainly plays a role in what fitness has become in terms of the content it's creating and how you're distributing it. When you think about the state of 
soul cycle now i mean as you mentioned initially when you joined it's how do we hopefully navigate out of this pandemic but it's been continuing to weather it has it been a you know wait and see or a maintenance mode or restructuring or just how would you even you know what words would you use to describe where the kind of business is now and how you think about navigating going forward that's a great question. Um, so it definitely hasn't been wait and see. It's been always at the ready. If I, if I was to describe it in any way, that's certainly my last 12 months here. And, and of course, I, I joined a team who have already been managing this brand and this business for 12 years, uh, 12 months of the pandemic before I even got here. Uh, so for the last two years, the team, but for the last year with me, um, I feel as if we are constantly looking around corners, poised to perhaps emerge from the pandemic. And, and we have had 12 months of some pretty stuttered starts and stops, you know, where we've uh, all of the last May, last summer, all of the restrictions around distancing and masks were removed. But then, of course, we and we, and we were making a brilliant recovery. I, mean, I was sitting here thinking, oh, my God, this brand is phenomenal. Riders were coming back. We had tears. It was just crazy time in a great way. And then, of course, we got hit by Delta. And um, then we kind of went backwards. And so, you know, we've been building the business. We've been doing a lot around programming. We onboarded an entirely new class of fantastic instructors called Group 36, our Group 36 instructors. You know, we were poised and ready to go. And we were going. And so what have we learned over the last 12 months? Well, we've, lo- we've learned to be poised and always ready uh, never to take a setback as a setback, but instead just a new opportunity to kind of rethink, reimagine how we do do business. Um, you know, I'm very committed. The team is very committed to being he- here for each other, for our, for our colleagues, but also being here for the, our riders and our community. So however we can do that, leaning into being in or being with our consumers wherever they are, whether that's at home, on the go, or with their, you know, Equinox Plus app or their at-home bike or with us in a physical studio, we're there for them. Uh, and so that has been the the definition, if you like, or the defining uh, parameters of the last 12 months. I think it's very well said. Uh, poised and at the ready for studios, for at home, for outdoors, <laughs> whatever that, that brings. And That's we're right. still sort of figuring that out in many ways. Um, maybe we'll take each of those kind of pillars and go through them. Uh, when it comes to the studios, how many are open now? I know there was obviously Delta and then Omicron and different variants. Um, so how many studios are open now and what are you seeing from a, a kind of attendance membership perspective? Uh, so we have about 70 plus open. The vast majority of our studios are now open. We still also have some outdoor activation. So, you know, that was one interesting pivot during the pandemic that will I think stay with us for the long haul, actually. It's a wonderful experience, as long as the weather's quite nice. Also to be outside. So we have outdoor activations, outdoor studios, if you like, which uh, we have not had in the past. We've got our indoor studios. About 80, 85% of our portfolio is now open and active. Um, And I will tell you, attendance is... Clearly, it's not where it was pre-pandemic, so I, I certainly wouldn't go that far. But, oh, my gosh, it's building week by week, month by month. The setbacks were, interestingly, Delta had a very different impact on our business to Omicron. So Delta, the you know, we've been building ridership. People have been coming back. The, the uh, decay, if you like, following Delta was a little bit slow. The kind of you know, the ridership fell back very quickly, very suddenly after Omicron. And equally, it bounced within three weeks. So, so literally, we're now back at where we were pre-Omicron. So, so we kind of got back much, much, much faster than we did uh, when we first experienced Delta. So we've got classes that are waitlisted. And then we've got classes that, you know, have a relatively modest number of riders in there. But uh, definitely riders are coming back. And we've seen this uh, in very significant numbers. And we've seen What's been interesting is having launched our digital platform during the pandemic and obviously seeing usage of digital kind of go through the roof, which you would expect when you don't have a physical brick and mortar alternative. What's been really interesting for us is to see how those two platforms are blending. So, you know, we often talk about omni-channel. We want to lean into this. We want to be where our consumers are. We're still seeing very robust usage of soul at home and, you know, uh, soul content and fitness content generally on our Equinox Plus platform. In tandem, we're seeing this 
substantial growth as people come back into studios. And so oftentimes people talk about it's either or. And of course, I don't believe that. I, I believe that consumers for a very long time to come will want to live a blended life. And, you know, the brands that will thrive are those that lean into that. And, and I think that you know, position soul cycle very well because we have a very significant brick and mortar business. We also have a very significant digital uh, presence. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're in that sweet spot where we offer both. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, we'll get to the omni-channel piece and it's, you know, folks thinking about what that future looks like. But as you were going through the kind of height of the lockdowns and then that that on again, off again, restart restrictions. Are we allowed to do, you know, this or that? Do we have to wear masks? Do we not? Uh, I think a lot of people kind of externally not in the position of maybe someone that has the insights right into the the business the same way that you do or another operator would is saying, gyms aren't coming back. This is this is the end. It's not going to be the same. Was there ever a point where you thought that or all along could you see this kind of uh, building demand or any time that the doors were opened, people came back or they were voicing that concern? How did you kind of deal with that in the in those peak moments where it did look, uh, you know, not favorable, right, for the, yeah. the kind of future of brick and mortar? So I'll say two things. And, and perhaps this is my experience in media that that, that held me in good stead for the, my experience in fitness. So. I've worked in media or had worked in media for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, digital, when it originally emerged in our world in the mid-90s, everybody said, okay, this is the this is the death of media, right? This is the death of print. Uh, print won't exist. And uh, print is very much alive and well. The challenge, of course, is how you adapt and lean into You've got to be where your consumers are. I mean, I keep on saying the same same thing, but it's like it's not one thing at the expense of the other. It's how do you leverage the opportunities from every platform that your consumers want to access your content and your experiences through, and how do you make those work for the brand? And so, um, you know, when I came into SoulCycle, I came halfway through this pandemic. Let's assume we are halfway through. Maybe we're not. But I came in a year ago knowing full well, oh, for 12 months, this is, you know, the fitness industry broadly, the physical fitness industry had been hit very hard by the pandemic. I wouldn't have joined had I thought, oh, my God, the, the end is nigh. Uh, this business isn't going to be around. I joined because of my experience in media, which has actually these things happily, healthily coexist in fact what actually happens through innovation and through disruption it is the it is the means by which we better serve our consumers because it forces us out of our comfort zone and it forces us to go the extra mile and so you know i'm a firm believer that you know all boats rise with the tide whatever that wonderful expression is and so the disruption and innovation that we've seen in fitness is a good thing it's good for consumers it's good for us it keeps us on our toes it keeps us innovating and uh, we will all happily coexist with each other. It isn't physical at the expense of digital or digital at the expense of physical. That's just not the way it works. And, and it hasn't in media for the last 20 odd years. So uh, I think the same is true of fitness for fitness. Yeah, uh, definitely. That the, the future, the, that omni-channel, whatever that looks like, giving consumers choice obviously is uh, is going to play out uh, and is, is proving to be um, the kind of path forward. And then to your point, poised and at the ready as those things play out and what That's exactly right. that looks like. Um, maybe one more question specific to the studio side. Um if you look at the kind of traditional model, especially around boutiques, right? The utilization is such a huge part of that. And it's paying that kind of premium price to come to SoulCycle for that, you know, as you mentioned, lights low, the music, the experience with the instructor. And there are, you know, the rents and the overhead, the instructors yeah. themselves, the number of bikes in a room. As the industry shifts, do you have a sense for whether or not or how that pricing model shifts or the, the even the footprint of studios shift? Have we gotten to that point yet or it's it's not clear? Oh, my gosh. There's kind of a lot of questions in that. So let's try and unpack it. And if I don't cover all of them, then just tell me. Um, so, look, we're very clear on the economics of the business. Oh, I mean, I'm certainly very clear on the economics of the sole business. I know precisely how many riders I need walking into a door and clipping in 
to, to make sense of, of what is essentially real estate, like, you know, our, our brick and mortar uh, business. And certainly when we look at the trend and trajectory of riders coming back into uh, into studios, it, uh, it gives me no pause or no cause for concern in terms of is the brick and mortar business model broken? It's not. What our business is, is dependent upon people, as you, to your point, walking through the door. It's not like we, we do not have an all you can eat model. Interestingly, what I've seen in the industry over, and I'm sure this predates my time here, but it seems that more and more boutique fitness providers are kind of getting into the membership uh, model. And I am seeing more and more kind of all you can eat business models emerging. Um, and indeed, SoulCycle launched its own Soul Renew, which is a recurring, um, essentially a, a payment plan. So you can you know, buy any four, eight, 12, 16 classes a month. And of course, we incentivize you to do so. Um, I think that's a really interesting business model because that gives you predictable and recurring revenue. It doesn't necessarily increase your revenue. What we have found is it does increase rider uh, engagement. So, so when people sign up for those things, and we're seeing quite a significant number of our riders signing up, that it's encouraging them to ride more frequently than they did prior. So it doesn't necessarily drive ridership, but it does drive engagement. And of course, it delivers predictable revenue. And that's quite nice. When I think about soul and the future, I mean, you said it, that you were very kind at the beginning. You said soul needs no introduction. Uh, but, but I will take a moment to just remind listeners that soul is a phenomenal workout, physically and mentally and emotionally. It does all three things. We're called soul cycle for a very specific reason. And so when I start to look at the business model, we've got an incredibly passionate, committed audience of riders who ride with us frequently and are returning in increasing numbers, which is great. And I'm very interested to explore this space around, particularly now actually, as we all emerge from the pandemic, the pandemic has put an incredible mental strain on us as a society. And I think Soul Cycle does, I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm a marathon runner, I'm a triathlete. I came across Soul Cycle as a fitness enthusiast because it's a phenomenal workout. What I learned very quickly as a consumer is it goes way beyond the physical. And that's the magic of Soul and the magic of our incredible instructor. This is an amazing opportunity, a time where I feel both souls consumers, but consumers more broadly, need more from us, that we're redefining the parameters of wellness and fitness. And I think that opens up a whole new opportunity for us, which is, it's like incremental. So, so when I look at the economics of our business today, um, I see a very robust business. I'm very happy to say that. But I see huge opportunity for us to grow the brand and grow the engagement with our consumers particularly given the fact that we're soul cycle and particularly given that we are operating in a period where consumers need more support than ever before because of the two years that we've all just been through. I mean, I certainly feel it as a consumer, as do many of our consumers at Soul. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. When you think about expanding potentially soul cycle and how you're reaching consumers and what you're providing to them, it, it sounds a lot like a lot of us had the realization that fitness is central to mental health. It's central to stress reduction. It's central to connecting with others potentially, whether that's of course in person, but even digitally at home, uh, leaderboards and virtual high fives and all those things. We've seen lots of different companies, Nike kind of getting in this, uh, they launched a program called Mindsets, which is a mental health, mindful movement. Calm, the meditation app is starting to get into the, what, it, what does that look like? What is the exercise movement piece? Obviously somebody like Peloton wants to push into meditation and mindfulness. Is, is that specifically what you're talking about? Because I think a lot of people, when they think of expanding, they're like, oh, are you going to launch a different modality like strength training? Or are you going to launch a, a treadmill from Equinox, right? Or is it this content meditation mindfulness that, that you're, you know, kind of thinking about? Well, it's all of the above. And I will say very candidly, we are in exploration mode right now. And so looking at there are, and again, maybe it's my media background. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in content and storytelling and compelling content that's, you know, that resonates with consumers that, that adds service and utility to whatever they need. We've got to be very clear what problem are we solving for and move into those spaces as opposed to, oh, I just kind of fancy getting into the meditation game. It's like, look, no, <laughs> what do our consumers need and want from us? Uh, certainly from, 
everything that's tracking right now, there's an abundance of opportunity because Soul stands for so much with our consumers and because it, our, our, our riders are so deeply engaged with the brand. So all of those things, different class formats, uh, different um, experiences. Music is very, very, very central to the soul experience. You know, we ride to the beat of the music. We don't ride to metrics. We ride to music. Um, so that opportunity about how can we lean into the experiential space around something that's so closely tied to the DNA of the brand. So really looking at all of the opportunities for us to better serve our consumers and our ridership. We'll, we'll be on the lookout. We'll watch it. And, and as that kind of exploration takes place where it ends up, certainly uh, looking now more specifically at the at-home experience, you talked about mm-hmm. launching the bike and that the kind of ridership or engagement has grown both through the Equinox Plus app and platform um, to the extent that you can. What does uh, growing and engagement look like? Are there any metrics we can put around that in terms of number of riders or sales or whatever figure you would point to to say this is working? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe, that's a terrible thing. To, we, we don't talk about the numbers specifically, like we don't publish uh, any stats that are specific to at-home riders, how many there are, how often they're riding. Um it's. I will say it, it continues to. It's a very, very nascent business. You know, we've been in this space for. Two, I think we started building this two years. It predates me, which is why I'm hesitating. But you know, two. We started this about two years ago, um, and we have a very significant number of um, riders who are who have either acquired the at home bike, or indeed have subscribed to Equinox Plus, which is a fitness platform that curates some phenomenal fitness content. And so for us, what the Soul at Home or our digital content strategy, if you like, what it's done is it provided us an opportunity to super serve existing riders who were, for whatever reason, unable or uncomfortable coming back into a studio. But it also has acted as a gateway to the brand so that you know, we've been able to introduce many, many, many more thousands of riders to Soul as a brand and to the Soul experience because they're accessing our content on the platform. The same is true for Soul consumers who have been, you know, who have had access to this incredible wealth of fitness content across Equinox Plus. And so it really has been um, definitely an interesting business to watch grow and evolve. Uh, it has been growing at pace, and I'm sorry that I can't get, give any numbers to give context to that. Um, and, but I very much suspect it will continue to grow and evolve. And I'm sure we'll see some twists and turns and pivots on our digital platform, as we should. I mean, the world is changing. We kind of feel as if we're emerging from this pandemic at long last. But who knows what that new normal will be? And so uh, that's why I kind of say you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's you want you want optionality, don't you? And uh, And that's what we've got, which is why... I'm very happy that somebody predating me had the foresight to to launch Equinox Plus and their Soul at Home bike. That it goes to the point you, to the extent that the consumer wants this blended or omni-channel experience. It's also beneficial for the brand to have it too, in terms of uh, diversifying revenue streams. And I think that that's kind of what you're talking about mm-hmm. during the time of the pandemic. It becomes how do we supplement? the in-studio, right? This is another option. We want to continue to reach them. We want to provide this and and have some level of engagement, whether they're using that exclusively or it's a way of introducing people to the brand. Is there a preferred or ideal split? Like, is it, hey, we're doing this and we think that the at-home bike will in platform will always be supplemental to the studio? Or is our ideal that it's 50-50? Is the ideal that the at-home overtakes the studio? How do you think about that? That's a really excellent question. We, we never actually talk about it in those terms. If I'm honest, again, I'm going to draw a parallel to my old world, if you like. So uh, I used to work many years ago. I worked in magazines when like you know, magazines were still a huge thing. Um, and we used to say that we wanted four revenue streams coming into our business. And it was half of them was consumers buying our magazines, either through subscription, 25%, or through walking into the newsstand, 25%. And we wanted the other 50% of our revenue to come through brand experiences, products and services. So, you know, whether I used to run the Essence, um, Essence brands, a huge music festival, Fortune Conference business. In style, we bought a you know very significant e-commerce platform. So we did use to articulate very clearly our aspiration to move from being a print-led business to being a omni-channel brand offering, which is why I think there's no such thing as 
new things really in, in a way because we're having this omni-channel conversation right now. So I don't have answers. We don't have specific parameters where we say, oh, we want four revenue streams. We want it to be 25% each. But of, but of course, you never want to have over, be over-reliant on one revenue stream because when that one revenue stream disappears, uh, that, that's, that's quite problematic. Uh, Soul, because of the strength of the brand and the brilliant work that uh, my predecessors and you know, the original founders did, was they just created a brand that has such resonance that we've always had more than one revenue stream. Our retail and apparel business has always been a very significant proportion of SoulCycle. And in fact, during the pandemic, when our studios were literally closed, uh, our retail business proved to be very resilient. So people really want that badge of, you know, that feeling of being continuing to be connected to the community with each other. You could still do that by buying a candle. I am currently smelling a beautiful grapefruit scented candle. That's the sole fragrance. You know, so people were still buying a product, apparel, athleisure clearly has been one of the big, huge trends during the pandemic, but also candles so that they, it is rep- reminiscent of that studio experience. So fortunately for Seoul, we've always had a very sizable chunk of our business, which is in other brand products and merchandise. Um, of course, I'd like more. I'd like, I'd like our other lines of business, our digital business, to be as robust as our retail business. And so, you know, you'd like two or three very robust revenue streams so that you do have that diversity in your revenue mix, which just certainly doesn't make you immune. But it gives you a buffer in the event that one of those revenue streams is compromised for any reason. I think that's well said when you talk about thinking about diversifying it. And it does in so many ways come back to the power of the brand in the first place. And we've talked about that as it relates to the studios and the at home. I think another area that I wanted to touch on was the instructors themselves, right? So much of this experience is built around that talent. Um, And now we've seen the previously it was the competition, right? In terms of just studios, SoulCycle was the preeminent studio. I think a lot of people in terms of like fitness instructors aspired to be, you know, a soul cycle instructor in many ways, that's still true, but now you just have a ton more competition from Mm -hmm. digital to in person to, you know, them going off on their own, right. And starting their own kind of personal brands. What has it been like to attract and retain talent now when there are so many other kind of avenues for them to pursue? So last year in 21, we recruited what we call the, we give each group a number. So last year was group 36, 36th recruitment of uh, instructors. It was our most heavily subscribed training group ever in the history of Seoul. And so, of course, I would say this, right? I'm a one, a brand fan. I've been a big supporter of the brand for five, or six years before I joined it. I'm now the CEO. So I'm kind of going to say this, but it's true. We do have the very best instructors at Soul Cycle. They are the magic of this brand. And what I saw and experienced firsthand as we were going through auditions, and because, can you imagine doing auditions in the middle of a pandemic? We were having people were sending in video tapes of them and they're videoing themselves on a bike. It was just extraordinary. The lengths that our community, our friends, you know, people who wanted to be a part of this experience, the magic of soul, the creative lengths they went to to send us their submission tapes and so on. So hand on heart, we have never had an issue recruiting instructors. I do believe uh, Soul Cycle is the pinnacle for fitness instructors, um, who, you know, who want to work in boutique fitness. And therefore, we've never struggled. This You make this point yourself, and you, you said it beautifully. Like Our instructors are the magic of soul. And uh, I want to quote one of our instructors in London who I was chatting to uh, a while ago, and he said, there's a little bit of soul in all of our competitors. And I said, yes, but they are not soul. And so, you know, we just focus on what we do. And we have a phenomenal team sitting outside my office who... Um, help us acquire and identify phenomenal talent and train and support that talent. And uh, thanks to them, they keep the magic of soul alive every day. It's great. I like that. And I I think in many ways, I kind of had it in my head and and in my notes that when you look at this evolution of connected fitness, it's like, 
I, I don't think any of those competitors are hesitant to say that like they really wouldn't exist if it wasn't for SoulCycle and that boutique experience that they created, that ultimately that's what they were trying to replicate when they said, hey, can we bring this experience into the home or can we recreate it digitally? So I think that instructor piece that there's a little part of the, that instructor in those brands, that, that's certainly true. Um, maybe changing gears as we get towards the end of the conversation, and mm-hmm. this might be uh, like the... Um, the, the bike conversation, right? You can't say too much, but uh, mm-hmm. I kind of have to, to ask. So there was kind of rumors that Equinox, the parent company was trying to go public and potential around what that might look like. Obviously prior to that years ago, SoulCycle was potentially going public on its own. Where do things stand now? How do you think about continuing to operate? Um, obviously again, to the extent that you can share, what does that roadmap look like? And, and is it kind of still kind of mapping the path towards potential IPO and, and, and going forward? So I am extremely happy that Seoul is one of the brands within the Equinox Group um, portfolio. Um, you know, the Equinox Group team are extraordinarily smart individuals, and I'm sure they're having lots and lots of conversations pretty much all of the time, actually. Um, I leave that to them. And so what I, ha- I can say is, you know, being part of the Equinox Group has been extremely powerful for Seoul. Uh, what, what certainly over the last two years when the kind of economic landscape of our business has uh, clearly not been uh, what we've enjoyed uh, in previous years. And so having the support and backing of the group has been wonderful and has ensured that we've continued to be able to operate in the way that we have and showing up for our con- consumers and continuing to invest in our business in the digital platform and so on. Um, those conversations that group, the group have Long may they continue, and uh, I, I leave those conversations to, to to those to those individuals. Fair enough. We'll, we'll <laughs> certainly we'll put that on the uh, uh, on the list as well of things to kind of keep an eye out for. It's sure. ultimately it comes down to what happens. You know, as the the hopefully right at this point, we keep saying, like you said, are we at the halfway point? Are we at the end? Are we, are we at the beginning? And nobody, nobody seems to know. But <laughs> hopefully, sooner rather than later, we're able to turn a corner and get a sense of what normal looks like again. Um, last question as we get you out of here: If we were to maybe jump ahead a, a year or two, and we think about we have in fact moved beyond the current state of the pandemic. Do you have a sense for what you think Soul Cycle looks like, or what you hope that it looks like in that kind of back to normal state? I don't know how far forward to cast forward when I say mm. this, but obviously, seeing all of our riders who there are still riders who are not back and and haven't been back for two years, either because that they've moved or, or they have continued concerns around um, uh, what it is to ride either in a mask. We still have mask mandates in a number of territories in which we operate. So certainly for the next six months, what I'm expecting to see is that our lapsed riders, the riders that haven't been with us for a while, will continue to return in the same kind of numbers that we're enjoying right now, which is I'm very excited about. I'd like to see more, even more full rooms. But as we think beyond that, like a further out time horizon, then really starting to see how Seoul unlocks the power of, one, the community, and two, the Seoul in Seoul cycle. Um, as, I, as I've hinted, there, there are some very interesting developments underway in terms of existing class formats, but also in terms of new content offerings that enable us to, I always say, use this phrase, super serve our consumers. Um, How we translate Seoul into a multi-vertical business is something that I certainly feel very excited and positive about. How long will that take us? Well, you know, it's a journey, isn't it? And, And we probably won't reach the end for quite some time, but certainly over the next six months to three years, we will see a broadening out of the product and service offering under the sole banner. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. A, a, lot, a lot to look forward to on that front. And I think um, wrapping up, is there, would you point folks to the website to follow along social media? What's the best way to kind of see what those offerings become and, and keep tabs on where the brand is heading? Social. Yeah. Instagram. Like that's where, that's one of the, uh, it, I t- it's, it's a, it's a, 
a mighty tool. We have an extraordinarily engaged group of consumers who continue to track what Sol is up to, even if they're not actually back in the saddle with us yet. So, yes, uh, as our plans unfold, follow us on Instagram. That's where we you'll see the magic of what the Sol offerings unfold. Fantastic. Well, we definitely hope folks check you out there and follow along. And thanks so much for spending a little bit of time with us today. Entirely my pleasure, Joe. Thank you.